Okay. Ready? Okay. Now it's four o'clock, so I would call the Public Works and Transportation Committee meeting to order. Uh, I just don't want to say that uh, we have uh, two meetings today, uh, the Public Works and also the Parks and Recreations. So we will have the Public Works and Transportation Committee meeting, open meeting first, and then close meeting, and then uh, follow up with Parks and Recreation open, and then Parks and Recreation close. So that will be the order of the meetings for today. And can I have the minutes for the uh, Public Works and Transportation Committee meeting on June 22nd, 2022? Move. Second, call the question to approve, oppose, motion carry. Next committee meeting will be on September 21st, uh, four o'clock uh, at council chambers. And agenda addition, any items to be added? Seeing none, so we go with what you have today on the uh, items. The first one will be cycling network plan update and final plan. Now, I just want to mention that this is um, a really long report. And also, I point out that we have the two different meetings today. So I would like to proceed in this way. I will ask staff to have some opening remarks. Then I will open for questions. And we also have one delegation to today, uh, Mr. John Rosten, and I would invite him to speak and then uh, we would come to uh, for a discussion and a, a, a decision. So that would be the order of our uh, handling of this item. So uh, I will give the time to the staff. Uh, does anyone want to make some opening remarks on this item? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to make a few remarks. Uh, the report in front of you today seeks council's endorsement to implement the cycling plan. The plan was developed over the last couple of years, including extensive consultation with all the internal as well as external stakeholders. Uh, we have carried out two rounds of very successful public consultation where we have received more than 1,600 unique feedback in the forms of completed surveys, survey comments on the maps, etc. As well, we have just under 2,000 visitors visiting the Let's Talk Richmond website. Um, in both round, in the two rounds of consultation. The plan was developed based on um, uh, media data, collision data, traffic data, combined with the public feedback. And this plan is a document that will guide staff to identify projects for implementation in the future. Um, by approving the plan today, uh, council will still have future decision-making capacity when these projects are presented to council as part of a future capital program. And with that brief remarks, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay. Now I will open this up to, uh, to members of the committee for any questions or comments. Bill? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not a member of the committee. I thought uh, if okay. I just make a comment and a, a question on page 15 of PWT. First of all, an outstanding report. Thank you very much and very, very comprehensive. Uh, just a quick question on long term priorities. I see nothing on, on there here with regard to any cycling connection to Burkeville or YVR. And I guess given we got 5,000 employees daily out at YVR when it's, we're full capacity, I just wondered why even in the long term we didn't put Burkeville YVR on it. And, you know, because, you know, Sea Island is still an extremely viable um, um, area uh, to go and, it, for those of us that have cycled out there or even run out there, there's lots to see in there. And uh, even if you go down Miller Road, uh, straight uh, down to the end, uh, to the uh, the edge where you um, you hit fencing and can't get into the airport, it's actually um, quite quick. So anyhow, it wasn't even on the list and I just wondered if that even could be added. I think uh, we, we'd be short-sighted by not uh, thinking about that. Uh, through the chair to Councillor McNulty, absolutely connection to Burkeville is extremely important. The plan has uh, one project where it enhanced the connection to the number two road bridge. And uh, certainly any additional projects identified council members or member of public can be implemented uh, through future capital projects. 
I'd just like to see it in the, in, in the minutes and in the report, the words Burkeville YVR slash YVR. Okay, good. That's on page 15 at the top, the first one. Good. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, Mr. Chair, if I could add to that a little bit uh, through you to Councillor McNulty. Uh, recognize also that um, YVR has their, their own programs. And if you recall, we brought forward um, some information, I think it was three or four months ago about uh, improvements out to the Iona um, park uh, that, that we're doing out there, but those are largely being done by um, uh, YVR. So certainly very important areas, but um, a lot of that work out there is is in their plan and we can certainly bring forward what, what they've got planned or what they've currently been working on. Thank you very much. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Linda? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, through you to staff. Well, thank you very much for a, a really great report, a lot of information, and really glad to see that there was so much engagement from the public. I think those numbers really speak to how um, you know the public is really interested in what we're doing with cycling. I you know we all hear from the public that uh, we need to be doing more. So a couple of questions. Um, how are the priorities? Uh, how, do, how do you come to the decision making on what is going to be short term, medium and long term priorities? Through the chair to Councillor McPhail, uh, we have six criteria that were used in formulating the uh, the priorities, including public feedback. And also uh, we look into safety, connectivity, and gaps, and also equity. So there are different uh, criteria that went into that decision-making process. All right, thank you. Um, now, we received uh, correspondence from Mr. Crow. And uh, honestly, I just kind of skimmed through it. There's quite a lot of information, and I don't know if staff has had time to look at it. Um, so I'd like to refer this to staff, Mr. Chair, at, a, at the end of the discussion, because uh, I personally, like I said, just had a chance to skim it. There's a lot of information, so uh, I'd like to make uh, refer this later. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lulu? Hi. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, a couple questions for staff. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. Homes on arterial roads with no front driveway, um, are they required to have an address at the back? Like, what is our plan for deliveries on those homes? So, for example, if we were to place delineators along the Williams Road bike path, paths that are there, it would be hard for delivery trucks to deliver to those homes. So it seems to me we should have some sort of plan and what it is we want and how we want uh, vehicles to be able to deliver to homes and not conflict with our bike lanes. Do we have such a plan? Through the chair to Councillor Lou, absolutely. That's a very critical piece uh, before any of the project is implemented. So any project that... Uh, I can hear you. Sorry. Um, we are uh, there's just some, uh, and sorry uh so absolutely so, sorry can important. those that are not talking please mute their microphones uh through the charity council Lou, absolutely that's critical and those are the kind of issues that need to be taken into account of prior to any uh implementation of the individual projects so you know every corridor there's uh different um you know, needs in terms of delivery, in terms of street configuration. So those are the kind of details that need to be looked further prior to implementation. Okay, a couple other questions or comments. I know railway in Moncton is very confusing. You come off with that multi-use path and then there's a one-way path and it's very confusing for people coming off that one-way path heading northbound from on railway crossing Moncton. Um, I'm also wondering how much it's going to cost to add plastic delineator. There's two bike lanes, like along Williams. So um, for a half mile segment, if we could get some sort of a memo on what, what it would cost to add delineators for those half mile segments. And then... Um, Excuse me, we still have some interference. Somebody's talking and it's hard to tell what the speaker's saying with that background noise. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just in a super chaotic spot right now. 
Um, no, it's not you. It's somebody else. I don't know who it is. No, but... no I, it's I believe... where I am. Yeah. It's my location. Sorry. Hi. Okay, and just my last one is if we can maybe upgrade our chicanes that are going through um, connecting pathways because we can't get bikes through some of those pathways, especially cargo bikes or bikes with um, uh, chariots attached to them. So if we can have some sort of, if, if we can see what the policy is on them and understand what that is and have some sort of plan of, to upgrade those, um, that would be ideal. Okay, moving on, uh, Councillor Hobbs. I don't know if there is. Thank you, and, and through the chair. Uh, well, first, uh, thanks to staff. This was a, a very comprehensive report, and the consultant's report was really in depth. Uh, so, a couple of quick questions. Um, just on the consultation, I heard the 1600 number, and I see different numbers like 203 for some of the other sections. Um, did we reach out uh, directly to other stakeholders, um, for instance, like the commercial trucking uh, business or some of the, uh, like, the Stevenson Harbour Authority and people like that that might be impacted by some of the changes that we're proposing, um, particularly those people that use large vehicles. I, I saw the internal and external consultants list, but I did not see those um, type of groups on there. Uh, through the charity, Councillor Hobbs, we did not um, uh, reach out to those groups individually. Uh, our thought is that, you know, in the implementation stage of the uh, individual, individual project, should there be any impact to those stakeholders, that's when the consultation will take place. Oh, that'd be great. And um, with the consultation, when we talk about 1,600 uh, people, do we have any idea how many of those are Richmond residents? Uh, we, I don't have that information handy with me. It's probably something I can look into it and provide that feedback. In truth, it might be hard to tell. I mean, I know lots of people from uh, Vancouver in particular and even North Van that love cycling in Richmond. So, I mean, it's important to them too. Um, but thank you for that. And um, on page 41 in, in, on our uh, public works document in the consultant's report, um, it mentions uh, in 4.3.4, it mentions uh, a savings of uh, $20 million. And I just wondered, uh, when I read that, I found that, I didn't quite get how we got to that number. Um, so is there a, a short explanation of that? Uh, I'll try. Uh, through the charity, Councillor Hobbs, I will try. Uh, so essentially, the cons we directed the consultant to carry out a cost a cost estimation exercise looking at ma order of magnitude costs in terms of complete street uh, rebuild so or reallocate uh, streets. So what that means is that Instead of rebuilding the street, uh, we look at how the existing street space can be uh, 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 modified. For example, taking away a lane of traffic, taking a, uh, away a lane of parking. And through that kind of exercise, the, the dollar figure of $20 million is the difference between street reallocation and the complete rebuild of the street. Now, the complete, complete rebuilding of the street, the cost will probably be higher because the cost figure does not include any uh, utility relocation or property acquisition, so likely that number will go up as we, uh, if that's the direction that council wishes to pursue. Sure. Okay. In, in that context, I get how there might be a saving, but um, okay. And just uh, two more points, I think, or maybe just one. Uh, the West Dyke Trail. There's some discussion about paving that, but that is not a decision that has been reached in my mind. Um, I'm not really in favor of it personally, but. Um, that's not a decision that's been made. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair to Councilor Hobbs, that's not part of this uh, cycling network plan. Okay. Um, yeah, very uh, detailed, lots of information, and um, I look forward to more discussions on it. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Councilor Wolf? Uh, th great. Thank you. Uh, through the chair to staff, just a few questions here. Um, I, and like Councillor McPhail, the um, letter that we got from uh, Mr. Crow today, that was, it's a lot of information, there's 26 points on there. My first uh, question is, will staff be replying to that and copying uh, Council on all of the 26 points, or does it require that referral that, uh, that was mentioned? Do the Chair to help? 
through the charity council wall, uh, staff are currently in the process of uh, going through the list as well. Uh, some of the issues we are aware of and already staff are already taking action. Uh, for the issues that we are not aware of, we will be uh, looking at what can be done and provide response as well. Okay, thanks. Um, the follow up to that then through the chair, um, I, I've had a list of items um, I was going to mention and, and uh, some were covered in that letter. So I don't want to uh, delay supporting this final plan uh, rather than asking for it to be um, tabled and, and then when more responses can come, it would be an even larger document and plan. Um, but I, I just wanted to have some assurance that, that some of these items that are not in today's network plan update are still part of some larger plan. And for example, pedestrian and bike bridges. And uh, I know later in this meeting, there's the aging and utility and road infrastructure and on there comes um, potential um, replacement of, of crossings. But even on those, you don't, uh, it's not including bike bridges. The one I'm thinking of is over highway 91 from Hamilton to the east end of Hamilton, uh, you have to go over that narrow pedestrian bike path. That, that's not on item four's agenda yet, it, and it's also not in this item. So could staff comment on where, where does that fall, something like that? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, that's probably something that I need to look into a bit further. But what I can say is that um, through the consultation process, uh, staff have review each and every one of the suggestions that we have received, and we have uh, considered those in the development of the plan. Um, there are certainly, there are some suggestions that are not shown within this 15 year plan, but they are they are on the record and they will be, uh, they are identified as potential future treatments. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chair, if I can maybe add something uh, through, through you to Councillor Wolf, um, you know, when we look at um, the, the correspondence we got from uh, Mr. Crow, um, you know, there are a lot of points, but a lot of them aren't, aren't necessarily so much oriented towards our, our cycling network plan. There's um, stuff in there that seems to be kind of parks oriented, like, um, uh, you know, putting picnic tables under number two road bridge and things like that. And, and there's a whole bunch of maintenance related items that we can certainly take care of that, that wouldn't necessarily be part of this plan. Um, you know, with respect to cycling and pedestrian bridges, um, yeah, th those were considered a as part of this plan, but some of those might be outside of the scope of the, the 15 years. These are uh, fairly expensive pieces of infrastructure. So I guess, you know, the challenge that you have when you move forward with these things is you have to determine whether, you know, you want to have one uh, bridge somewhere or if you want uh, five kilometers or 10 kilometers of, of bike lanes and things. And I think in you know, from from where we're um, looking at it right now, for a lot of these, uh, I think we need to get the connectivity in the city center um, to a much higher level than it is today. And, um, you know, once that's all fleshed out, we can potentially think about branching out into bridges to, um, you know, other areas and things like that. Okay, thanks. I have a few follow up questions uh, through the chair. Thanks. Um, so, and another uh, one of those things like picnic tables in, in shaded areas where cyclists want to take a rest and, and collect. Um, number seven road pier, uh, that's an area where it, it's a very small parking lot, it's gravel, it's, it, when it's wet, it's pothole filled. Um, and that's a place where cyclists gather to do their, their um, long distance routes along River Road. I see them regularly, but it's such a small area that uh, perhaps there, more cycling infrastructure needs to go into something like that. And I think that it would fall into more of a short-term solution. Um, otherwise, you're getting people spilling out onto roadways where there's absolutely no shoulder. Um, uh, so just a concern there to raise. Um, another one is, uh, which also came in this um, uh, letter from Mr. Crow, the Westminster Highway pinch point, I think he called it, um, where you're going east on Westminster Highway. I never go that way. I would always turn in on the old Westminster Highway under the Highway 91 and come out the other 
anyway, it's not called Old Westminster Highway. They're all the same name. But uh, anyway, that's it's incredibly dangerous. I think separating or putting something there should be a, a short term uh, addition. So I don't know if that should be an amendment to this plan or if that um, can be uh, expressed that staff maybe could be moving that up. Um, yeah. Um, through, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, uh, if I can take a crack at that one. You know, what I would say for an improvement like that, um, if that's something that, that council would like to see, they, they can certainly direct staff to uh, review that. But I would say that that's um, kind of more of a project level um, uh, piece uh, as, as opposed to um, the implementation of our, our network or, or plan. Like this would be... Um, uh, the plan's more looking at it from 10,000 feet, and, and this is more the project level that's probably at about 100 feet. So certainly, um, if council would like to see something like that, we can we can certainly receive that direction and uh, have a look at it. Okay, great. That, that, I think through, through the chair to the staff, that, that helps to know that there's this project level piece component that's kind of parallel to this plan strategy, because there's so much synergies between cycling in, in these projects and this plan. Um, last two point or one comment and then last question. Um, brambles or blackberry, like it, it's it's such a barrier. And when you've got a, a narrow path already for cycling and pedestrian shared, and then you get the blackberries pushing in from at least one side, uh, some places two sides, uh, it's an incredible um, challenge to negotiate the high speeds of cyclists or, or e-bike users and pedestrians and driveways like it's 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 a challenge and i hear that from a lot of people as well um my final comment or, or maybe a, a question um maybe doesn't need to be a question um the the interesting map on page 43 i think was the best one uh it showed the a, a different route to get from um east richmond to steveston highway and on there on page 43 it shows in the purple on Southeast Richmond, the long-term project that would kind of go from Nelson Road off Westminster to Blundell uh, to some other road, um, and then zigzag through to Steveston Highway. Um, I know a lot of people who that, like if, if that route were available, they would stop driving and they would cycle either through Richmond or from East Richmond to their place of work. Um, my question, I guess, is what if that is gonna remain long-term, because I know there's some challenges with the port owned land. How long term are we talking? Uh, I know a, a number of residents who would like to know the kind of rough ballpark number on how long they wait for that. Uh, through the chair to Council Wolf, uh, a big portion of that route uh, goes through the eco waste site. Uh, so, eco waste, uh, through the development process, our understanding from uh, in the past is that that connection through the eco waste site will be done within the next uh, 15 years, 10 to 15 years. And therefore that coincides with the uh, the timing that we are suggesting here. Great, thank you very much. Okay, very good. Now the letter from uh, Mr. Crow has been mentioned uh, by um, Councilor McPhail and um, Michael. So I just want to ask staff, um, do we need a referral as such to deal with it, or can we just ask staff to provide us with a memo as a kind of response to the letter and provide us with information, say, before the next council meeting? Do the chair to council, our staff can certainly look at, go through the list and provide a memo. Um, there, there, There's quite a bit of uh, items that need to be looked through and uh, uh, certainly we can try, but, um, uh, we do. We probably do need some time uh, to go through the entire list uh, that came forward uh, that we received today. Okay. Then my question is: Now, if we approve this implementation plan, and then in the future, if we find something from uh, Mr. Crow's suggestions that uh, that we should consider or we should add into the uh, implementation plan, there's still space and room that we can put it uh, into our implementation plan, right? Do the chair to counsel out. If that's the case, then there's definitely other opportunities to include those improvements into our capital program. Okay, great. So, Councilor McPhail, do you still want to make the referral, or you think this is good enough to, uh, to proceed? Well, I'm I'm satisfied, uh, Mr. Chair, that staff are are looking at it. Staff have said that, and I 
realize that, you know, some of these are, we, we can't have the answers by, you know, Monday. So I understand that perhaps, you know, we could have a memo in September when it's all done, because some of it is uh, long-term planning. And I think that, you know, these types of plans are, are living documents. And as staff said, there is opportunity to add items along the way. So I'm satisfied with that. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, seeing no further questions to staff, I would now invite uh, Mr. Rostin uh, to, to speak. Uh, Mr. Rostin, are you here? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So you have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, thank you very Five much. Minutes, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm speaking both as a cyclist and as a driver. And I realize that a lot of time and effort's gone into this uh, report with very wide uh, input. And there seems to be general agreement on the long-term objectives, but as has just been said, some of those long-term objectives uh, could be a very long time into the future. So I think the, the priorities are extremely important and I'm a, a bit puzzled about uh, how those priorities appear in the document. It seems to me to largely consist of adding bits and pieces now and leaving the major improvements uh, for much later phases. And in my view, the major improvements that should be done really immediately are at least one major north-south route and uh, one major east-west route that consists of a segregated two-lane bike path that is not shared with vehicles or pedestrians. And so the nature of uh, two-lane bike paths, I think, is extremely important because it allows faster cyclists to pass the slower ones quite aside from allowing bi-directional cycling. So uh, as, uh, as is mentioned in the report, excellent candidates are, are roads like Railway and Gilbert North-South and Williams and Blundell East-West. Um, and in looking at Gilbert and Williams, the strategy should be to discourage vehicles from taking those routes by reducing the number of vehicle lanes. So in other words, there should be routes in the city that are seen as primarily cycling routes and other streets that are seen as primarily vehicle routes. Doesn't mean each one can't use the other, but it, it, uh, people will soon know which one they really ought to be taken if they're in a hurry. The strategy of reduced speed limits for vehicles on, on bicycle routes is really a waste of time. Uh, in my view, almost no one pays much attention to speed limits in Richmond. The idea of putting bicycle lanes on Steveston Highway, even segregated ones, seems to me to be ridiculous. The cyclist should be on Williams, and what can be done there is you can take out the center turn lane and add a segregated bike path. So right now there are really three lanes, one in each direction and a center turning lane and uh, that could be removed and turned into a, a two-lane bike path. Uh, and also a segregated bike path along the dike would attract a huge number of users. You have only to look at Stanley Park to see what enormous attraction that would be. And Vancouver, of course, quickly found out what a mistake it is to have a bike path shared with pedestrians. And yet that is exactly what we have on the dikes in Richmond. A segregated bike path should be done now on the existing dike and not be implemented piecemeal as the dikes are raised. Speaking of which, the recent raising of the South Dike near Gilbert has, was certainly a huge disappointment to me with bicycles sharing the road with vehicles. And if all of you, as I have, have taken that route on a bicycle, you're constantly looking over your shoulder. And of course, when I drive it, I'm always trying to figure out how on earth to pass a cyclist without killing somebody. So there should absolutely have been a segregated bike path and that, that was certainly a disappointment. And the report shows that 73% of responders have segregated bike paths as a top priority, while only 1% of the existing bike paths are segregated. 
So really, we should be starting with Gilbert and Williams and devote most of the resources to a segregated bike path on the existing dike. And I think then you'll see a dramatic improvement in the use of bikes and similar devices in Richmond. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions uh, for Mr. Rustin? Seeing none. Uh, staff, would you like to provide any uh, comments right now? Uh, to the chair, nothing further to add. Okay, good. So with that, uh, I would like, to, okay, uh, Michael? Uh, thank you. Yeah, just one question through the chair from based on that delegation's uh, presentation. Um, and experiencing the, the dike road portion that was referred to there is getting very narrow and not having segregated bike lanes for uh, for cyclists. Um, could staff comment on what part of, uh, I can't remember what phase number that dike is in, um, but is the rest of the stretch on either side of that planning to have a segregated bike lane? Uh, to the chair, to Council Wolf, I do not have that information handy. Uh, either I can defer that to engineering. I see Mr. Irving can I speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Councillor Wolf. Uh, yeah, certainly when we when we did the design and the construction on that section, as as we look at future sections, um, getting uh, you know all our wants and desires on the top width of the dike is certainly something we're always looking at. It certainly does entail a lot of cost. If, as you can imagine, as we increase the top width of the dike, that increases a huge amount of material. So when we look specifically at that section at Gilbert and Three, and the design on that was done more than five years ago, uh, there was a balance and trade-off on the cost and the preservation on tr of trees on, on the inland side um, to go wider and have a separated bike path in that location at the time would have entailed probably a few extra million dollars and the significant removal of additional trees. Now, this is all just a balance of priorities. And certainly as we look at future sections uh, to both the east and the west, um, we're seeking to accommodate as much as we can in terms of not just the standard specified lane widths, bike paths and pedestrian paths, but a super dike concept where we can really build that out for future needs over the 100 year horizon. Uh, great. Just to, uh, thank you. And just to the chair to uh, comment on that is I, I know I've, with, what I've seen with the river road plan lately um, and some of the options there for retaining walls. Uh, and perhaps that is a newer design than what was used five years ago, uh, where trees could have been retained and it could have been higher and had a wider deck on the top and had a retaining wall on the inland side. But uh, anyhow, that what's done is done and we'll do better. Thanks. Okay, good. Uh, Carol? Thank you very much. I actually had a question of Mr. Rostin. Uh, you've really given this a lot of thought and I, I appreciate everything that you put forward. Um, I think I heard you right that you thought that the east-west uh, bike de de primary bike lane should be Williams. I'm wondering where you think the north-south best place for a, des not designated, but priority bike lane should be. Well, I, I, there's there's several, of course, you know, railway has been mentioned, but of course, it's got a lot already on it. Um, I really think Gilbert and then and then eventually Garden City. But on Gilbert, it's actually four lanes. So you could take you could take one of those lanes and and do what actually now exists on Williams. In other words, one lane in each direction with a turning lane in the middle. And then you have the existing fourth lane for a, a, a two lane bike path. Um, so yes, it would, uh, it, it might cut down on the, the traffic on Gilbert, but that's exactly what we're trying to do. Very, very good, good, good observations. Thank you very much. Okay, Harold. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to echo uh, Councillor Hobbs. I would not very much not want to see paving on the West Dyke. I think the West Dyke for bikes is perfect right now. It's 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 not a totally gravel top. It's 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 limestone, but what bikes use it have to go slowly. Once you pave it, you're going to have bikes whipping by, and even even if it's segregated, we have 500 pedestrians an hour walking through our farm on that dike in the summertime, and uh, 
the fewer bikes that, that are, are trying to uh, rush through them, the better. So I would not want to see pavement there. I think the West Dyke, Dyke is great the way it is, and I would want it off limits for major biking. Okay, very good. Now, we have a staff recommendation. Do I have a mover? Move, second. Any further discussion? Uh, call a question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carry. Thank you very much. Moving on to the next item. Provincial e-scooter pilot project. Any report for participating municipalities? Uh, Mr. Oh. Chair, nothing further to add to the report and staff are available to answer any questions. Okay, any questions? Uh, so, Bill? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, again, another outstanding report. I support everything I have. I, I have a question, uh, if I may. Uh, and here, Mr. McNulty. Have you Can't connected me? All right, we're connected now. I said a very, very uh, good report, uh, very thorough um, and um, uh, outstanding report, uh, lots of material there, and I appreciate it. And I, when it comes to council, I'll obviously be supporting this. I have a question, and if we look on PW uh, 213, I was out on Garden City this afternoon again, and it's been my pet peeve. We have e-scooters are not permitted on sidewalks or unpaved trails, and helmets are required when riding, etc., on facilities. And now we have two sets of rental in Richmond. We have the ones that Carol Day and myself and the mayor tried the other day, the scooters and the bikes, and we know how quickly they will go, etc. I have no problem with those. It's the other little scooters and bicycles that people are, are riding without helmets. And my question is, and I thought when I was in Public Works a while ago, we made a referral and we had, we we're gonna have some bylaws that when riding a bike on major arterial roads or city streets, you had to wear a helmet. And when you're using these little um, scooters, you know, even though you're pushing them, um, uh, whatever, people fall, people go in the wrong place, they go onto the sidewalk, they come onto the road, and um, my, my, and we have a rental lawn as well. These, all these bikes I saw in Garden City were rented somewhere. They were all green and all fluorescent orange, etc. but nobody wearing a helmet in the busy work. How can we deal with that? And I'd like to see a referral to staff, Mr. Chairman, I can't make it, that uh, we look at, uh, um, the safety features as we have here with the e-scooters be applied to all bikes, even on the west on the on the west uh, 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 by uh, dike trails. You know, people should be wearing a, a helmet. The only people that are going to give tickets on that are not the police, but the orthopedic surgeons at emergency at the at Richmond Hospital. Those are the ones that are going to give you a ticket, and. Um, uh, on it uh, when you come in with a, a laceration or a head injury or whatever because you fell off these things. So that's my pet peeve of my hobby and I don't know if any member of committee uh, would be prepared and if not I'm going to make that referral on Monday because I, I really think it's important that uh, we have a, but I also back to staff for those that have been around I thought we made this a number of years ago. Correct me Harold or Linda um, however, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but if not, I, I do at least we believe in. Otherwise, the report, sorry to deviate from it, but I thought it was not. Because we have that, then maybe we should have that across the board. And thank you to staff for, again, another good job. Now, actually, you know, this, this issue has been brought up uh, at the Community Safety Committee meeting. Mm. But, yeah, I would like uh, to let staff respond. Through the chair uh, to Councillor McNulty, uh, yes, it is the provincial regulation under the Motor Vehicle Act for all cyclists to wear helmets when riding on the road. Uh, at the end of the day, um, any violations are subject to enforcement, and, and that's where it really lands is on the enforcement piece of it. Okay, but how can they rent these other scooters that don't have any helmets there that are down here just over here at Minero, for example? Um, they're all over the city. I'm not talking about ones we just recently adopted because the helmets are there. Okay, that, I'm not, I'm talking about the others. How do we, uh, there's no helmet then for them to rent. 
and and yet we allowed them to uh, be put all over Richmond, and and people are renting them, and I don't know how they're getting them, etc. I've never run, but anyhow, um, I would agree we have it, but again, um, we're allowing that. I think we should uh, reconsider uh, um, what we're doing to allow these bikes um, that to be rented and picked up and used any time by people who don't necessarily have the experience. I think it was brought earlier, I'm worried about car traffic and, and the driver, seeing a scooter or a bicycle beside them in the lane or in no lane and going down three road uh, without a helmet and the scooter themselves not knowing where to, to go. So um, again, um, I think we really need to look at it and I would ask staff to, uh, to come back uh, with that so that we, um, we get the safety um, measures in place. Okay, so I'll leave it with you. Thank you. Andy? Thank you, and, and through the chair. Well, thank you for the report. Um, it seems like this has been quite successful because I see scooters all over the place, different uh, colors and everything as well. Also different electronic uh, modes of transportation zipping around. Um, as part of any business license, so for a rental, not, not just this one, uh, wouldn't it be a requirement? Uh, I remember working with these companies in the past that they provide helmets to their riders. Now they can't make them wear them after they leave, but isn't that part of the deal, so to speak? Through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, yes, uh, with the contract that we have with Lime uh, Technologies providing the e-scooter shared service in Richmond that I'm familiar with, they are required and do provide a helmet that is locked to every device. Yeah, and that's uh, yeah, sorry, uh, Mr. Chair. If I like, it, it sounds to me like, as far as I know, there, there's only one scooter rental company that that we've allowed in the city, and that that's Lime, and and they're doing pretty good. But uh, based on Councillor McNulty's comments, it sounds like potentially there's a bike rental company or or something like that that's available. And um, you know, certainly we we can talk to we can try and find out um, if there are bike rental companies about and um, and see if we can't do something about, um, you know, either educating them on helmets or, or doing something. But um, I have to say, like, I'm not aware of, of these bike rental companies. So um, certainly if you saw any logos on them or anything like that, that would be really, really helpful to um, help us track them down and, and find out what where they're operating out of. Well, thanks. I, I, for me, um, I think it's important just to point out that for various legal reasons and liability reasons, any company operating a business uh, sanctioned by the city of Richmond would be required to provide a helmet, and I believe they do. Um, one of the things that I have seen uh, as well, I think might be privately owned scooters, because there's a lot of those going around. So one question about uh, the speed, I, I note the speed that's in the report. But are scooters uh, that are either rented or even ones that are bought um, privately, are they governed? And that means, do they have a top speed? Is their top speed maxed out by a governor at, at the maximum speed limit for them? Do we know that? Through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, yes, we do have um, uh, speed limits with respect to the operation of e-scooters as part of the city's pilot program in the city. Uh, again, uh, any violations of that are subject to enforcement. Sure. I guess my point is, um, and maybe that's something I can check on later, is that you can govern any device to max out at a top speed. That's technically possible. So I just wonder if they are, but may, I'll follow up with that. Uh, Mr. Chair, maybe I can help with that a little bit uh, through you to Councillor Hobbs. My understanding of the uh, provincial regulation is that that it does require that they're they're not allowed to have both e-bikes and e-scooters uh, not be able to go over certain speeds. Um, that that's not to say that um, someone who who's bought one privately hasn't hasn't found one that that isn't governed and and may not actually um, be legal within um, within uh, British Columbia. Right, and I think some of that happens in a private sense. Uh, just on the helmet issue. I had the similar observation as Councillor McNulty in that, and it's not just with the e-scooter program. So maybe that's something that I will bring up at community safety, just the amount of helmet uh, usage with bikes and different things. It seems to have waned over time. And um, 
and maybe we'll follow up to see what level of enforcement there is, but that's not to do with your report, but I, I think it's a legitimate safety concern that he's raised. So uh, thank you very much for the report. Okay, uh, Linda? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to staff. Well, thank you for the report. And as uh, the chair mentioned, uh, the safety issues with e-scooters and e-bikes was uh, discussed at the last community safety meeting. And, you know, the OIC did mention that you know, he wasn't aware of any bylaw tickets that had been issued. He was going to look into that and that they were really focusing on education. And, you know, and I and I, I really agree. We need to focus on education. Today, I'm walking on number three road by the mall on a sidewalk and there is a bike lane and I hear a beeping like a bell. And I look behind me and there's a young man on an e-scooter, no helmet, and he's carrying a, pa a package, driving with one hand, and I had to move. <laughs> well, you know, that's not right. acceptable. It's a busy street. It's a busy sidewalk. There's lots of people there. I, I thought it was an accident waiting to happen. Um, and I am really concerned when we read on our PWT 213 under e-scooter safety that, you know, while Vancouver Coastal Health is gathering the data, they are seeing an increase of emergency room visits. Now, last year... Um, I, when we signed up for this, Kelowna had already been doing the pilot and their emergency room doctor had come out and said they had seen a marked increase in accidents directly related to e-scooters. So I think it's really important that, you know, we keep reviewing the data and uh, perhaps this will come up again at Community Safety. I think the OIC was going to get us some more information. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, Michael? Uh, thank you, through the Chair. Just two questions. One follows up like many other councillors are mentioning around e-scooter enforcement. And I would highlight on page 213 under the heading e-scooter enforcement, it does mention that uh, our Richmond RCP received uh, no complaints and received no recorded enforcement activities for e-scooter. Um, my question to staff, um, do we know if other jurisdictions who are part of the pilot, um, have they had um, enforcement activity? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, I don't have that uh, data and information handy with me at this point in time. We can uh, confer with the other pilot communities and uh, report back. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks to the chair. I, I, I would also expect that in the OIC's response from the community safety meeting that that will come maybe in there instead of duplicating it. Um, the second question area I had was, uh, if you look at the map and the attachments, um, I can't remember the page right now, uh, it, it, does, it shows that the exclusion area um, is Sea Island and the Portlands. YVR is our largest employer uh, for Richmond residents, uh, yet you can't take an e-scooter there. And I thought the whole thing about the, the Lime program was that you, it was intended for like the, the short trips and, and someone who lives in city centre, I would, I would think that getting from there to the um, airport might be a short trip, but perhaps that's because it's an, an employee and you're working an eight hour shift. The Lime is not really intended for being parked for a whole day. Um, but if there were um, drop off spots there where you just use it to commute and then it's not yours during your shift and then you hopefully get another one or you have to candle line um, um, so could staff comment on opening up um, the federal lands of Sea Island uh, for, the, for future pilot expansion? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, uh, the city has only been approved for uh, participation in the provincial pilot program for roads with our, within our jurisdiction. Uh, I believe uh, many of those other areas that you uh, described our federal and um, YBR lands and so they would have to apply to the province for participation in the e-scooter pilot program um, to permit such use within their uh, boundary but we can certainly work with Lyme where possible to expand the program within uh, city limits. Great yeah then just a quick follow-up then yeah I would I would assume that city and CI or YVR talks can can bring, make that happen and and I and could you, and I guess you've clarified that YVR would have to apply as opposed to Richmond applying for an amendment to our plan uh, or our, our zone uh, it sounds like YVR would have to take that on so as long as we're in, in, 
telling them the information. And, and if we as a city in, would encourage that, I, I think that would be the next step. So thanks. Yeah, right. Mr. Chair, if I could just um, address that a little bit, like uh, through you to Councillor Wolf, I think the, the thing to keep in mind here is that um, the, the scooter regulations are not province-wide. This is a trial program that involves a discrete number of uh, communities. And um, I'm assuming that, um, you know, if the program um, after three years um, comes out to be a, a good program and, and goes province-wide, then, you know, then I would imagine that it would be able to expand to all these other great places that, that people would like to go. Okay, very good. Now, similar to uh, comments being made by um, Linda and a few other councillors, you know, I share the experience that uh, some of these people using the e-scooter are uh, using them in a very dangerous manner, both to, to themselves and to other road users. So I think that kind of concern has to be, has to be uh, conveyed, not just by the Community Safety Committee, probably by, by us as well. And I also noticed that there are lots of confusion because as what um, uh, Mr. B just mentioned, uh, there's, there's no unified provincial regulations. Uh, each city has something different. So I think what applies to one city uh, in the pilot project may not apply to the others. So I think that's a lot of confusion there. Now, I want to ask a question because I remember, remember that uh, when we approve LINE to be the provider of the uh, rental program, um, they seem to mention that they can really track the behavior of those e-scooter riders, you know, that if they ride on the uh, pedestrian, pedestrian walk or um, going over speeding, is that the case or do, or do they have any information, any data that uh, we can ask for uh, in terms of whether or not they've noticed any any violations? Mr. Chair, uh, the benefit of the shared e-scooter system is that it has the technology of geofencing and a bunch of sensors on each device that can uh, define no-go zones such as sidewalks and other undesirable areas of the city so that the devices just don't operate and can't be checked out or driven, ridden into those locations. So definitely there's more control with respect to use and uh, areas of operation and even the speed can be controlled to not exceed uh, the provincial limits. Uh, we haven't uh, received any information from Lyme indicating that there's been violations of uh, those um, regulations nor have they reported any incidents or accidents from their fleet of service. Now, what, what is the arrangement about the reporting? I mean, how often do they have to report to us regarding those matters? Or, I mean, is, is, would it depending on us to ask, can, to ask them for the information? Because I did see, you know, those uh, uh, rental uh, e scooters, I mean, violating all kinds of rules that were being set, like, you know, uh, on the pedestrian sidewalk, going too fast, you know, I, so I think if there's no arrangement for them to provide us with information periodically, perhaps I think we should begin to ask them for for information. Now the project has been implemented for, I mean the rental program has been implemented for how long? Three months? Mr. Chair, the launch of Lime uh, scooters uh, began May 4th of this year. Okay, so I think perhaps you know, we should ask them for certain information uh, quarterly. So I don't know how, how, do you feel, yeah. how do you feel about that? Mr. Chair, absolutely. Data collection and metrics uh, in order to evaluate the success of this program is critical. We do have access to data uh, seamlessly from Lyme's dashboard that we can retrieve. And we also meet with them to collect data every two weeks at update meetings. So we're continuously collecting information about the performance of the shared e-scooter service in Richmond. Okay, so can you bring forward our concerns to, to those meetings? And also, um, if you have the information, maybe in a form of memo, provide to the, to the, to the members of the, the committee and also to other councillors. Mr. Chair, absolutely, staff can do that. Okay, very good. Uh, Carol, I see your hand. 
Thank you very much. Um, I was speaking to some citizens who walk frequently on the railway corridor, and they said the same thing that everyone else is saying, that their people are just going way too fast on the electric bikes uh, and the e-scooters. And then I said, well, there's signs that say, you know, slow down, and there's a fine if you don't slow down. And this lady said to me, yeah, but the writing's this big. Like, if, unless you're right in front of the sign and you, you read the small print, it's just not legible. So I would suggest that we make miniature versions of our regular street signs, speed limit, maximum fines, if you know, $500 fines or whatever it is, and make them, you know, a good, like, like a 10 by 12 size so that they're super easy to see and there's no excuse for going too fast. Okay, can we refer this to staff so that uh, you can see what is the appropriate? Um, through the chair to, um, uh, to Councillor Day, um, yeah, we, we certainly could put up more signs, but I'm, I'm not positive that's the whole solution. Like um, at the end of the day, um, even on our, our roadways, uh, we post at the edge of the city that the, the speed limit is 50 kilometers an hour for cars and unless otherwise posted, right? We don't have that many um, actual speed limit sides within the city. So, um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, we, we certainly can, if that's what, what council would like to see. Um, but, um, I'm, I'm not convinced that, um, making the, the letters bigger is necessarily going to help. I think that, um, you know, as, as part of this, we have a lot of education and especially with the uh, rental scooters, they get a lot of education on what the speed limits are and they're actually governed. So mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not, we will have to talk to them to find out if it's even possible for them to speed. Um, certainly, you know, we've discussed that maybe there are other scooters that uh, people buy privately that can go faster and, and that's a, that's gotta be addressed through enforcement. But, um, you know, um, we certainly can put up more signs um, if that's council's direction. Big one, yeah. Like something really out there, even in reflective lettering because if the public are educated that, hold on, I thought that was too fast, they themselves will help police those speeders by saying, hey, read the sign, dude, you know, right? I can see that being a very effective tool for the public. Well, I, I believe that uh, education is important. However, I think education and enforcement has to go hand in hand. Okay, and uh, final question I have to staff. Do we know uh, the volume of those uh, rentals, e-scooters going out every day? Because I don't know the proportion of um, those e-scooters users being renters. Maybe, you know, this is only just a small proportion of the people using the e-scooters. And maybe the wild leaders are more of those people who own and, and, and have e-scooters themselves. And then they might be the, the majority of the wild leaders, I don't know. So do, do we know the, the percentage of the, the, or the numbers or the volume of the um, rental uh, uses? Uh, Mr. Chair, we do get that data from Lime. Uh, right about now, it looks like they have 100 devices out in the field and about 67 trips occur on these devices on a daily basis uh, in that order. Uh, we will certainly take back the concerns that committee has raised today with our shared e-scooters um, service provider and ensure that there aren't any violations occurring, at least with their fleet of vehicles. Okay. Can I also uh, follow up on what uh, Council Magnetti has mentioned? Can staff find out if there's another uh, company renting out e-scooters without, you know, our knowledge or permission? Can staff find that out? Mr. Chair, yes, absolutely. We will look into that matter further. Okay, very good. So we should look into that. Okay, with that, uh, we have a staff recommendation to receive this for information. Do you have a mover? Second, I call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carry. Moving onward to number three, extension to contract 6917Q, Public Works Lease Vehicles. Uh, Suzanne, anything to add to the report? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have nothing to add. Any questions? Andy? Yeah, thank you. And, and through the chair, uh, just very briefly, uh, 
I think that this recommendation makes total sense considering all the circumstances. The contingency uh, in it is that for anticipated uh, increased maintenance with the uh, extension of it, or what would that be for? Thanks. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Hobbs. Uh, the contingency is just in the event we have to uh, lease one or two vehicles for a month or two longer. It just gives us a little bit of uh, of room just in case. Uh, generally, we look after the repairs separately. So it would just be if we needed to keep one or two of the vehicles for a little bit longer than anticipated. Thanks. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay. To move of staff recommendation. Move second. Call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Moving over to item number four, uh, Agent Utility and Road Infrastructure Planning 2022nd update. Uh, Mr. Ho, any, any? Mr. Chair, nothing, nothing to add to the report. Okay, any questions? Uh, Michael? Uh, thank you, uh, through, through the chair to staff. My question involves uh, what's on our page 244 or 245. It's the list of the non-major road network overpasses bridge in inventory. So <clears throat> my question is um, the, oh, sorry, I just swallowed something. Um, the pedestrian overpass uh, or, or bike overpass over Highway 91 in East Richmond going from Hamilton to Thompson Gate is not included here. And my question is, is it because all of these are featured crossing water courses as opposed to highways? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wolf, uh, the reason would likely be that that particular uh, bridge is, is not part of the city's non MRN uh, assets. So what, what would it be part of then if I'm asked through the chair? Because I might want to ask for a referral on it um, to get that group of uh, infrastructure brought to us for for analysis and maybe uh, even at the same time as this because I would think the budget is going to be the same for both through the chair to Councillor Wolf that would likely be MOTI or TransLink but it'll be uh, something I'd have to look into to, to confirm okay could I uh, through the chair could I ask for um, staff to come back with a memo on that then uh, to provide input on all of the joint associated uh, similar infrastructure so that we can get uh, an input and could that be done um, by the council meeting um, because I would like to if we're approving the kind of budget that comes with this update and plan then perhaps we could infuse some of that budget for these to go into those partnership projects. Can staff? Uh, yeah go ahead. Uh, through the share, yes, we, we can certainly do that. Um, generally speaking, um, all of the assets that are MRN and outside of the city's responsibility would be funded by the province. Okay, yeah, I'd like the list of them. Uh, and if, if anything to like the, this table provides, um, what is it crossing? What is it a roadway is it for pedestrians? And you don't have to give me the breakdown or us the breakdown of the replacement rehab year. But uh, if you could give us some maybe existing projected life expectancy, that kind of thing. Thanks. Now, I, I wanted to follow up on that too. Now, if staff find out that this is not within our jurisdiction, it's uh, maybe, you know, the responsibility of the ministry. Usually, you know, um, who has the obligation to um, maintain and upgrade or even replace? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, typically that would be up to the, the province to, to do that work. So we can, you know, advocate for it, but we cannot include that piece of um, property into our own plan for replacement, uh, right? As far as I know, that's correct. Okay, good. Okay, uh, Andy? Uh, thank you, and through the chair. Well, thanks for this report. It was really interesting as well, and it, it you know, it concerns things that you know, most people don't often think about in their daily lives until it doesn't work or until there's some kind of disaster that causes an interruption to service. So um, the increase since 2001 was uh, pretty significant, uh, going up from 3 to 7.5 million. And that exceeds, I think, the consumer price index by quite a bit. But I think it's tied into um, 
you know, aging infrastructure as the report is titled and that kind of thing. But can you just comment on that a little bit in terms of um, how things have developed in Richmond, um, you know, subdivision development, that kind of thing through the 50s and 60s. And my understanding is that now a lot of cities are building things out with, you know, better uh, technology, better, um, um, e better um, services, and that sometimes it'll go from like a 25 year life expectancy for like uh, you know something like a pipe to even a hundred years so can you just comment on why we're seeing this increase uh, through the chair to councillor hobbs a big reason of the increase is because of the uh, construction costs and uh, escalation that that's occurred in recent years um definitely uh, uh in terms of uh, how development assists in that uh development provides a lot of uh um, assets to the city, and when when they do that, they they upgrade the infrastructure as well. Um, but in terms of how the the city um, where it started in the sixties and seventies, what that means for us is a lot of the assets would be coming up for end of end of life uh, replacements in a couple of decades. Um, certainly, when we do upgrades uh, through our capital program or capital projects right now, um, we we look at new technologies. Uh, the water main replacements is a good example of that, where we're replacing. Uh, asbestos cement uh, material uh, mains with uh, newer materials like PVC, uh, HDPE, which offer uh, better seismic resilience as well as better uh, life expectancy. Uh, I think uh, that'll be very good. Just um, in terms of the construction costs, uh, extended life and uh, fewer costs to the taxpayers. The um, without the grants, um, I read in the report, and I take it from reading the report that. Um, by using reserves, um, you're confident on the identified sources of capital funding uh, to do what we have to do. And is there any is there any weak point in that? I mean, I guess what I'm saying is because of the reserve uh, contingency funds that we have, uh, we're able to do these uh, within budget. Um, but is there anything that, uh, from a risk assessment point of view, could complicate that? Or is there a weak? Is there one side that maybe isn't funded as well, like perhaps roads or something like that? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, I guess the general message is um, we've been experiencing quite a bit of uh, cost escalations over recent years, and uh, what that's meant for us is uh, the 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 gap um, between where we're at right now with the long term sustainable funding has increased a bit. Um, at the same time, it, it does look larger than the actual technical impact because. Uh, the cost increase has happened in recent years. So what it means is, is we're going to need some time to, to readjust to that. Um, in terms of the service levels that we've been providing, that hasn't really been impacted. Um, in the short to medium term, our utilities have been pre performing uh, very well. Um, and uh, yeah, generally it looks okay for the short to medium term. Yeah, okay, I'll just one final comment then. I mean, that's excellent because I don't think every community uh, in Canada or in North America, you know, has that capacity to do that and to absorb the increases through uh, reserves. So um, I'd just like to compliment uh, staff for putting us in that position and actually compliment previous councils uh, for uh, the foresight in the policy that allows us to do that. I think it's pretty impressive. Thank you. Okay, uh, Carol? Welcome. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I wanted to um, just ask, do we, as a matter of course, send these files, these reports to our MPs and MLAs so they know what's coming down the pipe and they can prepare and, and you know, work on their end for us? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, uh, no, we don't send it to the MPs in particular. Uh, this is looking um, specifically at, at city-owned assets and ones that we're responsible for uh, maintaining as well as funding. But, uh, when I look at some of the uh, the lists, I mean, there are items that they should probably know about that, you know, it's, it would because they'll get bullets that there's money available in, in one of the provincial or federal funds. And I would think that if they have a, like a grocery list of projects that do need to be done in a five, 10, 15 years, it gives them the opportunity to, uh, to help us out. Through the Shared Councillor Day, uh, we, can, we can certainly send it to them for their uh, review and consideration as well. Thank you. Okay, very good. So with that, uh, we have um, a staff recommendation uh, for receiving it for information. Then move, move for a second. 
ask the question. Those in favor, oppose, motion carry. Thank you very much. Uh, manager's report. Mr. Chair, I have two updates from transportation. Uh, the first one is about a new driver feedback sign installed on Ferguson Road on July 7th. Uh, this digital display sign advises motorists of their traveling speed. Uh, the sign is located approximately 300 meters west of McDonald Road where the shoulder bike lane ends. And the new sign helps to reinforce the 30 kilometers per hour posted speed limit that council adopted for this section of roadway uh, in 2021. Okay, uh, the other one is uh, that the upgrade of cycling facilities on Granville Avenue um, has been uh, complete. That's the installation of delineators between the existing bike lane and the adjacent vehicle lane uh, on Garden City to Railway Avenue on Granville Avenues. Very good. And any further updates? Seeing none, may have a motion to adjourn the meeting. Okay, meetings adjourned. So now moving into uh, the closed meeting. So we start.